Hello, this is the Jury Charge in Literary for the Hundreds class. I'm going to start out with an article called Fitness Without Exercise. And it says, take heart, you don't need a sweatsuit to stay in shape. Ready? Sam, 89, is cultivating cabbage in his backyard in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania, while his wife Liz, 91, is tying up sagging tomato plants. Next door, his neighbor is riding a stationary bike on the back porch, trying to tie up some sagging parts of his own. Sam and Liz keep their lawn as closely cropped as a GI's sideburns. Sam tells his neighbor that maybe some people would do as well to push lawn mowers as to ride bikes that go nowhere. The latest medical knowledge is beginning to bear him out. Recent studies show that even mild physical activity is helpful in counteracting the effects of a bad diet or in lowering cholesterol and high blood pressure. And the new findings make sense. Despite what, what athletic shoe and yogurt ads would have us believe, only 10% or fewer of U.S. adults exercise vigorously and regularly. The failure of the fitness movement in the last 20 years has been severe enough to suggest that we should try a whole new approach away from performance and toward overall health and well-being. We don't come here to bury exercise, only to redefine it so its benefits are more accessible to those of us who need it most. For starters, we need to appreciate the value of physical activity that has nothing to do with putting on a sweatsuit or counting sit-ups. Even routine physical activity can help protect against heart disease, whether it produces a target heart rate or not. Exercise gotten in large sweat producing chunks counts, but so does exercise gotten in bits and pieces. Body fat can be burned by walking a dog as well as by running a marathon. Each works. Where's the proof? Well, a study found that exercise levels of 2,000 calories a week afforded significant protection from heart disease. Most of those calories, however, were burned during day-to-day -day activities like walking and stair climbing and through light sports such as golf. Another study from the Health Institute did a or held a study of 12,000 high-risk men analyzed by Dr. Arthur Leon of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health found that men who engaged each day in at least 30 minutes of moderate physical activity had one-third fewer fatal heart attacks than those who did less than 30 minutes a day. Those doing more than an hour of similar activity daily had no greater levels of protection. 
in a similar study found that a moderate level of fitness offers a considerable benefit over a sedentary level. You get much more benefits out of being just a little bit more active. For example, going from being, going from being a couch potato to taking a brisk walk for a half hour several days a week can drop your risk of a heart attack dramatically. This is a major victory for walkers, golfers, homemakers, and fix-it types. Clearly, there's more room on the fitness bandwagon than anyone previously thought. Miles jogging and toes touched? Why not leaves raked? laundry hung too dry, or elevators avoided. This new way of playing the fitness ball game has especially good news for anyone in favor of saving a nickel. Greater self-sufficiency can help us burn calories instead of cash at the health club. Exercise has been portrayed as the universal elixir. The more it hurts, the more it heals. But that kind of fitness has flopped because aerobic exercise is seen as boring, time-consuming, strenuous, and impractical. Jogging doesn't clean the rain gutters on the house or get the wash done. Not a single exercise currently endorsed by the fitness establishment is capable of producing anything other than sweat and muscle tone. For a nation raised on practical wisdom and the work ethic, that's been hard to accept. Though we may care about our health and the way we look, those concerns pale next to our need to be rewarded for our labors. Habitual exercise, of course, can strengthen the heart's ability to pump the blood. But what strengthens the pump doesn't necessarily clean out the pipes. And it can be downright dangerous for people with coronary artery problems. As highly fit as 10 mile a day runner Jim Fix and Olymp Olympic rower Jack Kelly were, both had fatal heart attacks caused by blocked coronary arteries. A person's fat consumption, cholesterol level, blood pressure, lifestyle, whether you are smoking or drinking or both, and mental outlook may be as important as his or her aerobic power. It's time we stopped rushing from work to get to an exercise class, only to feel justified in eating double bacon cheeseburgers. The major lifestyle diseases, heart, bowel cancer, hypertension, that exercise is supposed to combat can also be deterred by combining exercise with a low-fat, high-fiber diet rich in complex carbo carbohydrates. Once you're eating sensibly, there are plenty of things you can do to burn the calories without health club hogwash. One, make chores count. What's got four walls, a yard, and the potential for offering more forms of exercise than any fitness device ever designed? Yes, the average home. Between the sweeping, scraping, painting, polishing, shoveling, hammering, weeding, vacuuming, there's not a muscle of the body untouched. 
Two, add resistance activities. These maneuvers, which provide resistance that tones and strengthens muscles, include chores such as splitting and stacking firewood, raking, scrubbing floors, or even kneading bread, and sports such as golf, if you carry your clubs, hiking in hilly terrain, gardening, skiing. So why hoist dumbbells? Lifting and carrying a baby will do plenty for your arms and shoulders. Three, try mini walks. At the office, take long cuts to the bathroom or copier. Why not phone someone down the hall when you can go visit them? Treat yourself to fresh air at lunchtime. Go for a walk. Four, climb more stairs. Up to four calories are burned for every 10 steps climbed. Five, stay on your feet. The 10 to 20 calorie an hour difference between standing and sitting can add up. By stretching as you stand, you can burn even more calories. Likewise, pacing burns more calories than standing about one for every 14 to 18 steps. Six, park far from the maddening crowd. You can burn extra calories each day by taking it a little further and parking your car in a remote area of an office or shopping mall parking lot. This will add to your steps. The past 20 years have been less of a fitness boom than a battle. Many fitness efforts fail, not because we don't try, but because we try too hard. The solution is a moderate approach. Gradually, your life with light, energizing, and productive activity, rather than besiege it, with useless workouts. It's the way to achieve real fitness because it's the only way that will last. Okay. I have some straight testimony here from a witness. Okay. Here we go. But he was nice he was real nice to me, made a joke about it. He said, boy, I have really got me a dandy wife. She is hearing things now. But I didn't find out until later that it was something that went along with the problem. I had no idea. I was just scared at the fact that things were happening to me that I didn't understand. Please excuse me. The longer it has gone on, the less I feel about wanting to handle it mentally. Then there were aches. My neck was hurting. My back was hurting all the time upper back, up in here, and these muscles felt like somebody hit me with a truck, and the headaches. I had what I would call a sharp shooting pain. You see, I have had a little headache once or twice in my life, and that is the extent of what I would call a headache and I never had a toothache or never had a headache so when I got the headaches at first they were a pressure feeling but then on the left side mostly I started getting a shooting pain that would go 
from this area back up into here. I had that every day, all day, morning, night. It didn't matter. I would wake up at night. I wasn't sleeping. I was taking drugs, aspirin, I mean. That's about the extent of anything that I ever took. I started taking all kinds of aspirin and all those different brands. I've got bottles left at home where I would try several of one kind and think, well, maybe this will work. And we still have got half of the bottles from about five or six different kinds that I didn't use. It just seemed like the longer everything took place, the worse I was becoming instead of getting better. I mean, that was my feeling. Then there was that snowstorm last year in April. I do remember when we had like four feet of snow. I was at work and they didn't shovel the lot or where the parking area was where I was. I had my own shovel and I did shovel that out. I stepped out in the snow. It was about a three foot bank of snow and I stepped in it and twisted my ankle just enough that I felt a little pain. And I think that I'm paranoid at the fact that I am going to have to go through another two years of not being able to walk or dance. The only thing that I found out and I was not even aware of is that the pads on my feet from being a dancer were quite well used. They explained it to me, but no problems with my feet or anything or ankles or legs. It's a long answer. He had a lot to say. Okay. Got a couple more minutes. I'm going to read a story to you called Once on Horseback, Nothing Stops Paul Revere. Ready? Rachel's voice rose up the stairway. Why can't a younger man carry this message in the dead of night? You have seven children, Paul. Yes, and it is for them I ride. Sarah sat up in bed. Quietly, she crept to the stairs. Under the railing, she watched her father and stepmother in the cold light of the April moon. I can't understand why you're always the one sent. Ride to New York, ride to Philadelphia, and now tonight, Ride to Lexington. Maybe I'm the best rider the Patriots have. Sarah's father smiled and ran his finger down his wife's cheek. Sarah drew back. Rachel Walker had been her father's second wife for only a year and a half. Sarah was 12 now in this year, 1775 and remembered her own mother very well, remembered the same gesture made to her. Sarah tried to swallow the sudden tightness in her throat. She started quietly back up the stairs. Be careful then, Paul, Rachel said gently. Sarah leaned forward again. Just in time, she saw the door quietly closing and their dog's tail disappearing through the opening. 
Sarah could not help herself. Rachel, she whispered. The dog went out too. Rachel glanced at the dog's sleeping place by the fire. Oh dear, yes. Well, he'll be back by morning. I can't risk opening the door again. It's nearly bright as day out there. And time for the British night patrols to be out. You might as well come down, she went on. We'll have a cup of tea. There's a blanket by the fire. As Sarah lifted the cup, she watched Rachel. It was Rachel that was up in the bedroom, tending to the crying baby, that or when Sarah heard a scratch scratch at the door. What could it be? Should she open the door when Rachel had once already warned her not to? Scratch, scratch, it went again. Carefully, Sarah slid the bolt. In a chill of blast air, the dog ran in and sat down panting at Sarah's feet. A rolled piece of paper hung from his collar. Sarah bent over and untied it just as Rachel came down the stairs. Read it, Sarah. Sarah unrolled the note. Tie my spurs to the dog's collar and send him back to me. Get them quickly, Sarah. Rachel pulled the narrow belt from around the waist of her robe and handed it to Sarah. Tie them now. Hurry. Can you imagine? Sarah's fingers were all thumbs. At last, she made a final knot. She scooted the dog to the door and opened it quietly. The two men were walking down the street. She dared not make the noise of the latch clicking, so she held the door closed and waited. Scratch came a sound at the door. Sarah rushed to open it. The dog ran into the room. His collar was empty. Thank God, she said. Once he is on horseback, nothing will stop Paul Revere. Okay, that concludes our literary and jury charge class for the 100 class. Have a great day.